morning. We'd like to welcome you to Senior Symposium 2011. Uh, first of all, let me thank all the judges. We know you came a long way, so thank you for coming. We appreciate your time. Uh, like, I, like Mr. Garnish said, I'm Nick Borrego, Christy Bylan, and TJ Gibis. Uh, we are Hooked Inc., and we've designed an assistive technology fishing device for people who are handicapped or disabled uh, through an organization called Accessible Fishing down in Little, uh, excuse me, uh, in Lakewood, Colorado. This is just a quick overview. You can kind of see what our apparatus looks like. On the left-hand side, we've got the full apparatus itself with the controller down here in the left-hand corner. Uh, we call the casting mechanism, which is right here. And then we have the controller box right here. And we're going to go into more detail here in a minute. To give you a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. We talk about our problem. Uh, why we were brought this to this attention. Why we were brought, uh, excuse me, why we have this. Why we need to help people who are disabled and what we're going to do about it. Uh, then we're going to talk to you about the casting process, the whole mechanics of actually fishing and trying to mimic the human arm in, that, uh, in our apparatus. Uh, we're going to talk about current solutions that are out there on the market right now, what's been done, what we're going to, and how we kind of incorporated some of that. Our project goals, what we wanted to incorporate in our design to make it more efficient and user friendly. Uh, then we're going to go through our design approach, uh, how we are going to approach this problem, what we needed to do. We're going to go into a detailed design. Uh, go into the minor details about each little component of our apparatus. Uh, and then we'll go into the engineering testing, kind of tell you what we did to get the numbers that we needed to make this successful. Uh, do mathematical <coughs> models to prove our reasoning behind that. Our compliance testing, which is when it was built, we were able to see what worked, what, what we needed to uh, improve on. Our future recommendations, what we do if we have insufficient funds and more time. And uh, we'll conclude it up. Uh, our whole apparatus, and then we'll take your questions at the end. At this time, I'd like to hand over to Chrissy to talk about our problem. According to the CDC, one in five people are disabled in the United States. This includes mental and physical disability. However, with our project, we are hoping to help those who lack the physical ability to cast and reel a fishing line. This project was brought to us by Peter Paulus, who is the owner and operator of excuse me, Accessible Fishing. And he has two different programs that he does with his company. So the first is a float trip on a raft, and that's where that picture is right there. And that is done on North Platte River in Colorado. The other is a dock trip, and that is done at Lake Mary at Rocky Mountain Arsenal. So with this system, we had to mimic the human arm in order to, to cast and fit or reel in a fish. So basically, we had to do a system where we trigger the line, pull back, and then bring forward and release the line at an optimal time. We also then needed to reel in the line at varying speeds. One, to hook the fish, which we call hookability. So normally it's a jerk, and we needed to mimic that somehow. And the other is just to <coughs> reel it in slowly to catch the fish in general. So before we started this project, we looked at solutions that are currently on the market or that have been designed. The first is the University of Wyoming 2002 prototype. This only goes 0 to 15 feet, which unfortunately is not adequate for Peter's setup in that there is a spook zone of approximately 30 feet where they go fishing. So anywhere around that 30 feet closer, there will not be any fish or the likelihood of you catching a fish will be very low. You have to launch it out past 30 feet. Next one is a torsional spring DC motor with an electric clutch. This one can go approximately 38 feet and it costs $3,400 on the market for a customer right now. This next one is a linear spring with a line plunger and a stepper motor. This one can go 60 to 80 feet depending on the circumstances and it costs approximately $1,000. And this last one that we, were, that we looked at was a linear spring with a linear actuator and a mechanical release latch. This one can go 100 feet in optimal conditions and it costs $1,014.25. Christy? Okay, now I'm going to talk about the project goals that we set for ourselves and as well with the clients. The first one, as Christy discussed, a lot of these projects are extremely expensive, and so in order to make it more accessible, we wanted to drop the cost. And so we went ahead and set a goal for a target of less than $1,000. The next one, a 30 feet to 80 feet variable distance, that came from the client. A lot of these apparatuses, except for the UW2002 prototype, is not variable distance, they just have one cast distance. And so we wanted to be able to incorporate that 30 feet for the spook zone, 80 feet, because that's about as wide as the Platte River gets. So <clears throat> Next, we needed the auto reel system, and this was also put forth by the client. Um, he wanted two feet per second just so that you're reeling in nice and slow, and then uh, the fish can take a look at the lure, and 10 feet per second to set the hook in the fish's mouth. 
Um, all these calculations you're going to see in the system is based on a 3 8 ounce lure because that is what Peter uses. Next we have a, a weight of less than 15 pounds. A lot of these, uh, a lot of these wheelchairs are really quite heavy. They're about 200 pounds, 300 pounds on the raft and so weight wasn't a huge thing. We wanted to go ahead and try and drop the, rate, the weight. We wanted a lifetime of approximately five years. As we stated, these apparatuses are expensive. You don't want to have to replace that every one to two years. We also wanted to maximize the safety. We incorporated emergency shutoff, and as this is going to be in an aqueous environment, we made it waterproof. We also wanted a battery to last approximately three hours, as that's how long the float trips are, and a product delivery by May 8th. Now I'm going to go into the design options that we could have taken. Uh, we, uh, we set ourselves up for a spring, and so we decided that we were going to go for a spring, and we could have either gone with a torsional spring or a linear spring. The torsional spring, because there's such a massive different distance difference and the energy required from 30 feet to 80 feet, we would have had to have a lot of coil. So we went with a linear spring. The release mechanism, we could have gone with an electric clutch, a mechanical clutch, or a solenoid latch. An electric clutch, the more torque that you need to apply, the more current that is necessary to set up that, that um, the current, or set up the electron field. And so we didn't do that. And a mechanical clutch, there's no timing associated with that, there's only one release point, and so we went ahead and went with a solenoid latch because it's less energy intensive, and we would be able to set the timing on it. <clears throat> and then to apply the force or load the spring, we could have gone with the DC motor, and this would be like a cable spooling around a DC motor, and that would have been difficult because this needs to be able to re or to, uh, it needs to be a cyclic process. Uh, a pneumatic cylinder was put forth by the client, and so he wanted us to investigate that. However, preliminary calculations revealed that it was not very energy efficient, and a linear actuator is what we ended up going with because it just incorporates a DC motor with a linear motion. Now, as I discussed earlier, we have our design options or our solution approach that we took. We have our linear actuator here, up here with the coupling. And so what is inside that coupling that Nick will go into detail later about is a solenoid release with a quick release pin. And then here we have our linear springs. On this specific example, we have two linear springs just to get a better combination because we spec'd out one spring, but it's difficult to size that spring or purchase that spring. So two springs is easier to accomplish. And then we also have the solenoid latch, as you can see here. Here's the reel, and here we have a solenoid, and we're going to go into this later in more detail to release the line. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Nick to talk about the specific design details. All right, thank you, TJ. Going to a detailed design about the linear actuator. According to the whole apparatus, you can see here we have the casting mechanism, which is this box up here. Uh, we have the coupling system here attached to the linear actuator, and to supply power to the whole thing, we have a 12 volt DC battery down there, just your normal car battery. Uh, the linear actuator, if we take an exploded view, uh, you can see that we have a quick release pin, a solenoid that TJ had talked about, and our linear actuator. And in order to incorporate the solenoid to hit the pre-release pin at a fixed distance, we would hit it every time, just like pushing it with your thumb, uh, we developed this coupling device. Uh, and that just attaches to the linear actuator, so that way when it goes up, we can hook it into a receptacle and then pull down, elongating the springs, thus sending out the rod and the lure. Uh, so you can see here that we have, with the pin and solenoid coupling right here, it'll go up into this bell receptacle, which I'll go into in a little bit more in a second here. Um, but why we did the linear actuator is because we can vary the amount of force. Uh, it's a six inch stroke, 25 pound force, completely weatherproof linear actuator. So as it's going up, it could hook in, we could pull it down one inch, up to six inches, variable three quarters of an inch, just to get the optimal elongation, so it's variable distance. To set up the linear actuator to the base, it's basically set up like your car antenna uh, that you have in the hood of your car. It's a spring system. So why we did this is because when you're pulling up to go into the receptacle of the bell, when you pull down, it's not a straight linear motion. You actually have a curve because it curves along with the moment arm. In order to incorporate that, we put in a swivel joint with the spring. So the linear actuator is held up with a swivel joint and the spring, and the swivel can go up to 30 degrees any rotation so to accommodate for that arm. Now to go into a little more detail about the moment arm here, according to, it's right, as to the whole apparatus, we have it right here, the casting mechanism, and the moment arm is located here. Now the moment arm, shown here, it has had a 15 degree canter. And why we did this, why 15 degrees? Because Peter has said that's what works. Why this works is because, think about it, when you're casting, if you have a fixed motion and you pull back, you don't want the lure getting caught in your pole or your line as it is so when you cast. So the lure at 15 degrees, kind of let it, hangle up, let it dangle off to the side so you can cast out more efficiently. In our moment arm here, we have a good hole, it's the rod, lie around here, it also has the area for where the springs can attach to, and it also has our swivel bell receptacle as shown here. Why we made it a bell shape is because when the actuator is extending up with the quick release pin, instead of it being zero, zero tolerance, 
and hitting directly on, the bell is sort of like a funnel. It can kind of guide it into the receptacle, make it a little more easier to catch in there. So now we hand it off to Chrissy to talk about the reel. So with the reel, which is right here, it's actually composed of the reel itself and a motor behind it, which is right around here. And then it's also the, um, the solenoid that's right there to control the triggering mechanism. So with the reel, we actually have it in line with the rod, and it is on a 30 degree ramp. These were both done so that you could reduce the tension on the eyelets, on the fishing pole, and on the fishing line itself. It just makes it smoother to cast out and smoother to reel in. Uh, this, pro this reel itself with the motors was actually supplied by um, our customer, Peter Paulus. We purchased it from him. This was because we could not find a motor that was adequately sized and that was still being manufactured. So we had to contact Peter and he supplied us with this system that he is selling and manufacturing right now. And then with this solenoid system right here, this is actually taut, this wire right here. And when, it get, when this gets activated by the electrical system, which we'll talk about in a minute, it gets pulled down, so it's a pull solenoid, so that it tightens the line so the line will not be let out while you're setting the linear actuator. So next I'll talk about the stand, which we just used a simple dolly. Um, the nice thing about this is that it's very transportable and it's fairly condensed. It really reduced our size greatly. Um, it has a 600 pound capacity according to the the specs that we purchased it at. Our product weighs 80 pounds in total, including the battery, so it is more than oversized. Um, it's also made of steel, so we were able to weld on our components very well and get our struts secured. And then it also has all-terrain tires. We've been taking it up and down stairs and through rocks and mud and grime, and we've had no problem with it getting stuck or anything of that sort. So with this mechanical system, we had to implement an electrical system to control this entire device. We base it on a five input controller, which is our joystick. We have a forward motion, which brings the linear actuator up and um, connects it to the ball joint that, the bell joint, excuse me, that Nick was just talking about. And then you go backwards on the joystick and that lowers the linear actuator so that it cocks the springs. You then have the button to basically release the entire system and send it forward. It controls the two solenoids, the one that's in the linear actuator to release the springs and the one that's in the reel to control the line. And then you can go right and left to control the reel motor. Right gives us that hookability speed, which TJ will talk about. And left goes a slower to reel in at a two feet per second speed. So with this joystick, we had to come up with a way to implement it. We use a peripheral interface controller, which is also called a PIC. And I know the circuit is, this drawing is hard to see, I apologize. But this is our controller up over here. It comes in and when it's received inputs, the PIC then can, has programming in it that we have designed that will send a pulse to one of these components. This is the linear actuator, and it, this is an H-bridge so that it can flip back and forth, go up and down without having to unhook it. These, this controls the linear actuator solenoid, this one the real motor, and this one the real solenoid. And all of them are controlled by Darlington transistors, which just allow the circuit to be saturated and switch really quickly. That, I'm going to hand it to TJ. Thank you, Christy. Yeah, I'm going to talk about the engineering testing that we went through to determine the, the values that we needed to make this design. First, we needed to determine the reel speed, and so what we did was we just went out fishing, and when you're reeling it nice and slow, you want that fish to take a look at that lure. It's about two feet per second. In order to set the hook, it's typically a jerk motion. Of course, we couldn't account, or it would have been easier to accommodate that in the motor, so we did at a 10 feet per second. And then we took these calculations, applied them to real torque and power calculations. However, as we discussed earlier, we couldn't purchase any of the motors that we spec'd out. I believe that we did it three times, and we purchased a motor from the client. <clears throat> now I'm going to talk about the mathematical models that we used in order to determine this. First, what we did with the 80 feet cast, we determined the energy required and the velocity required for the lure to cast 80 feet using these equations. And so once we had that, we built that into an Excel spreadsheet and we were able to optimize that solution with the launch angle. Uh, 80 feet came out to be 43 degrees and 30 feet came out to be 41 degrees. And so we split the hair, we split down the middle and went 42 degree launch angle. Once we had that, we had the velocity at the tip required for the cast of 80 feet. We were able to take that back into the rotational system as this is rotating about a fixed axis is omega is equal to V over R. R is the radius of the tip, so that was seven feet, and we had, so we were able to determine the radial velocity required to launch the lure. 
Once we had that, we were able to invoke that into an energy model and use a SOLIDWORKS analysis to determine the moment of inertia required for our moment arm, or the moment of inertia for our moment arm. <clears throat> and then we could determine the energy required to spin at that pass. Here are the, rota or the mechanical energy required. Here's the rotational one half I omega squared, where omega is equal to the rotational velocity. I is the moment of inertia. The kinetic energy of the lure is one half mv squared, velocity squared, mass is 3 eighths ounce of lure. <clears throat> spring is one half kx squared, where k is the spring constant, x is the elongation of the spring, plus there's an initial preload necessary on that spring, and so the energy comes up to fx. And so what we did is we took that energy for the rotational required for the speed and set that equal to the spring energy that we were going to store within the spring. And you can see that here on the bottom of the screen. Next, I'll talk about the compliance testing once we had it built. The client was concerned primarily with the variable distance and the ability to set the hook in the fish's mouth. Manually, we were able to do 30 to 65 feet as we didn't have the circuits working yet. We got it working recently, so we'll be able to test that and I'm sure that we'll be able to get 80 feet. Um, again, 35 to, or 30 to 65 feet, we were doing that manually and so the timing was very difficult. I'm very confident that we'll hit 80 feet. Again, with the, with the hookability speed or the speed to set the hook, it was, we calculated or tested 7.3 feet per second. Our goal was 10 feet per second, but as we said earlier, we were forced into using a motor that we weren't able to stack out. So the future recommendations as we were going through this project, at what would make this project work better? Um, a rotation, so when a person wants to cast to the left or to the right with Peter, he just turns the whole boat. He wasn't concerned about that at this time, but we would maybe implement a horizontal axis that he would spin at about 360 degrees or 270 degrees so that he doesn't have to do that. Uh, circuit design, we would use a universal plug and that would help with the controller as I'll talk here in a minute. And we would also recommend a feedback system. As we didn't do any feedback, you can't optimize each and every cast, so a 40 feet cast or a 50 feet cast. <clears throat> and then for the controller, as I said earlier, a joystick is what we implemented. But if we used a universal plug, you would just be able to unplug a sip and puff or plug in a neck controller or something like that. A sip and puff is just the inputs would be you blow in or you suck. Um, also, I mean, with the controllers, you could take this as far as you wanted to go. You could use something like this where it was a wireless remote. Really, just your imagination is the limit. Now I'm going to talk, hand it over to Nick, talk about the conclusions. All right. Uh, as we said, our, our design specification, we wanted to keep it under $1,000. Now, we came to a total of $15.76.28. The reason, main reason this is we couldn't buy bulk quantity. We couldn't buy, we wanted a six inch piece that cost twice as much as just buying six feet of it. So that's mostly what the increased cost was about. If we could do it just ideally, we believe we could get between the $750 to $1,000 range. Uh, we believe we have a unique technology here. Uh, we have a linear actuator with a quick release pin, something that hasn't been done before, and we believe this is actually something that could be implemented in future uh, designs. Uh, we were able to achieve variable distance and set the hook. So we'd have a constant reel and speed. We could uh, increase the voltage and get that hook ability. Um, some of the parts that were met is that we were able to keep it within our, our size. It's pretty compact. There's not very much room on that float trip. Uh, so we were able to do that. As far as, um, excuse me, weight, we wanted the whole casting mechanism to be about 15 pounds. It's 15.99 pounds. Uh, so we were able to keep within that as well. And um, also as far as, like I said, the variable distance and, cast and hookability, we were able to accomplish that. Uh, alternative applications, it could be scaled up or scaled down. Uh, if you want to take this deep sea fishing, you could do uh, just increase the motor, increase the linear actuator force, the spring size, obviously different equipment for a different application. Basically, we just beef it up or you could you know, take it down a little bit. Um, and we are still planning on having it delivered by May 8th, the working model. Like TJ had said, when we tested it just the other day, it was, their circuit wasn't working. As of 10 o'clock last night, we got it pretty much working. So we we're confident we were going to have this design built and completed and fabricated, and it'll be on the water by May 8th. So at this time, we'd like to give a special thanks out to Dr. Barrett and Mr. Morton and Peter Paulus of Accessible Fishing. We'd also like to thank the National Science Foundation, who through their grant of the Biomedical Engineering Research to aid persons with disabilities, we were able to fund this entire project. And of course, we couldn't have built anything without the help of the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences shop. And now we'd like to open up to questions if you have any. Probably need that if you're buying quantity. 
question. Yes. Are, what would be what would be the retail price of this thing if you could uh, get all the materials together for a thousand bucks and then have to put it together and market it? It would probably be the same price. Peter does not profit with any of this. He actually builds and designs most of the designs we've shown you. So he would actually build it, use all the parts, and it'd just be cost of parts. So it'd be about seven hundred fifty to a thousand dollars. Thank you. Thank you. How involved is your customer in your demonstrations up to this point? How involved? Yeah. You. <laughs> He's kind of getting tired of us calling him. <laughs> hey, Peter, we've got this. Uh, we're incorporating this. It sounds great. He's actually working with um, uh, the hospital. I forget, I slips in my mind, down in Lakewood, Colorado. But he has an electrical engineer and a mechanical engineer also on staff helping them to come up with new designs as they go along. So we come up with a design. We say, hey, Peter, we would send him our papers, our reports, and say, this is what we're going with. What do you think? He can combine with them. And they'd be like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Let's keep moving forward. I'd like to go back a little bit to the beginning of the design and you can touch a little bit on what processes you went through and what your decision making processes were for determining your spring your release, your course, how much was you calculating and looking at alternatives versus a little bit of, yeah, we can just use this one. Just a little discussion on your initial, initial selections. I'd like to answer that. Uh, start off. Uh, you're talking about the whole evolution of the whole process and how we were like, okay, why should we go with this compared to this? Some uh, of the early design assumptions and choosing uh, the actuator that you chose and, okay. and how you went about choosing those components. Okay, we knew that uh, doing like, the whole analysis with the springs, we knew we didn't need much force. So we went to be able to spec out, okay, we need about 25 pounds force as a maximum. We started there. Um, as an evolution, this is all now basically steel design. We had started out with aluminum to go lightweight. Um, manufacturability down in the college engineering shop, welding aluminum wasn't a very viable option. So they were able to help us modify, modify, and modify. As of about two months ago, still modify and to make it into the process it is now. Um, as far as calculations, um, TJ, would you like to answer? Yeah, I can go ahead and take a look at that. And actually, we have a slide prepared if you'd like to see all the calculations that we've gone through. However, to answer your question, the first thing that we really did was um, Peter asked us to take a look at like, the pneumatic or the hydraulics. And so we went ahead and did some preliminary calculations on that. And based upon that, we turned it's not going to be very efficient because you're going to have your heat loss and things like that due to your pressure build and things like that. And so once we went ahead and decided that a linear actuator would probably work the best for this, what we did is we went out on the market and looked to determine what was out there for like a waterproof or a weatherproof actuator. And we found this 25 pound actuator. It comes in a four inch, a six inch, and an eight inch stroke, I believe. And so once we had that, we went ahead and selected the actuator. And we, then we went ahead and did our energy calculations based on what kind of, you know, the velocities that we needed. And as I discussed, this was an iterative process, of course. And up here, you can see our calculations that I can go through in a minute if you would like me to. Okay, I'm just kind of curious on processes. Yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, I guess it was, that's how we started. We started with the linear actuator, and then we could design the moment arms and how much the spring was going to elongate. And I guess one thing that I should mention is that in order for the rotation, we just deemed that it was going to just pull back 90 degrees just to fix that, you know, and settle down some of those unknowns. Okay. I have another quick question, and this is my math. The, the goal of being under 15 pounds, is that for the the tree on top of the Yes, plate. the casting mechanism. This was going to be a total of 15 pounds or less. And, and then, so you're saying the whole unit right now is 80 pounds? 80 pounds, including the dolly. battery and the dolly. This whole apparatus okay. weighs 80 pounds. So I'm going to kick it right back up and move it out. It's easier than moving a box of paper. Okay. Is it possible for you to demonstrate it here, of course? I, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> you, and it would probably go through that wall. It's, it's, right now what we have set up is uh, our circuit board is uh, we're waiting for an H bridge, the one that we had into breaking. So right now if we mess with the wires, we can plug it in, pull it back, release it, and it'll, it'll launch. But we still need to, uh, since it got fixed at 10 o'clock last night, uh, the actual timing of releasing the line at the optimum angle to release up you know, the lure, I wouldn't guarantee that at this second. But it will be guaranteed by next week. Thank you. Yes. Okay. One other question. Uh, your battery life is only three hours. Normally, when you go on a fishing trip, you fish more than three hours. 
Peter actually gave us that specification. He, his trips last about three hours. That's why we went with that design specification of three hours. Okay. I'd also like to add that it will definitely last more than three hours. There's yeah. adequate energy there. Yeah. Uh, that's it's, what I was thinking about the 12 yeah. yeah. So if you needed to go down and wait, the battery would. The ba yes. The reason why we also chose the car battery to be a 12 volt battery that size is because it helps bring down the weight. It kind of, you know, the center of gravity is going to be a little bit lower, so when it's casting, it's not toppling over. We have time for one question from the audience because we need the next team to have time to set up here. Sure. If I heard you right, the real speed is fixed either two feet or the 10 feet per second? Is there a way to make that variable? And have you looked at being able to get a specific action out of a lure in order, in order, in other words, to bump a lure or something like that to attract the fish? I'll take this. So with the um, real speeds, we actually have that as a controlled in our controller itself. We have what's called a pulse width modulation, which just changes um, how much current and how often it's being supplied to the reel itself. And so for the two feet per second, we just lowered it so that it would decrease the voltage so it would go at constant speed. And for the 10 feet per second, we just went at the max speed it could possibly go. So yes, there is a way to change the speed by just changing the code. I'd like to answer the last part of that question. As far as I kind of imitating anything, I guess if you just kind of kept hitting the left side of the joystick, kind of it's really in two feet per second, reel it in, give it a little jerk, you know, as if you were just doing this. Uh, that, and that's our best suggestion right there. Um, ultimately, we designed for one basic kind of disability. I mean, there's so many different kinds of disabilities. Like TJ said, you know, we have a neck, uh, you know, a sip and puff. We kind of aim towards one and kind of went down that direction. So that's why we have a basic controller with limited mobility. Alright, let's thank our speakers.